Where's that buck? Right over there. Thank you. It's nice to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Christians can have fun. Amen. Amen. And we can even laugh. <laughs> Hold on one sec. Technical difficulties. Got to turn you on. <laughs> Safe. <laughs> the guy came down. He says, Flash. Lawrence Walk learned the counts of four. <laughs> it's always one or two. <laughs> There's a Bible company. It's having their Christmas banquet. So they had a fellow that sold four times more Bibles than anybody ever sold in a year. And he did this year after year. $2.4 million worth of Bibles a year. So they had this big banquet in New York City, and they'd invite him to come, but he never came. So this year they said, now if you come, we're going to give you a gold watch, and we're going to give you a... a Bonus of $25,000, but you got to show up. You got to even speak for us at two minutes in front of the microphone. So he showed up. The president gave out the awards and honors and so forth. Said, now we have George Smith, the top Bible salesman in the whole world. We're going to give him a bonus, $25,000 and a gold watch. And would you please come up here, George? And George came up. Said, now, George, we appreciate what you've done for the company, what you've done for the Lord, what you've done for people. But these people want to do that well, too. They'd like to sell $2.4 million worth of Bibles a year. Would you please come to, to the microphone and tell us how you do it? He says, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so he comes up to the microphone. He says, well, 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 well. I go to the front door, and I push the button. <laughs> and, and a woman, a woman comes to the front door. She opens the door. I said, I said lady, would you like to buy, 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 buy a Bible? Or would, would, would you like for me to stand here and re 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 read the whole book of Matthew? <laughs> He said, they always buy. <laughs> I got one more, and then I'll get down to business. <laughs> Three fellas got off an airliner out in Los Angeles. It's about 15 years ago. Two of them are seven feet tall, and one's seven foot six. And he's got a high headdress on. And they're from the South Sea Islands. They're not black, and they're not white. They're just in between. And they're met there to plane by Barbara Walters, Ted Koppel, and I think Eric, Eric Severed Head. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so they're conducted into this newsroom where they have the visiting dignitary be. So Mr. Severed Head, he says, Oh, King, it's nice to have you here in our country. By the way, how many of you ever heard uh, shortwave radio? Would you raise your hand? See, I have missionaries that call me from all the islands and all that kind of stuff. And uh, if you people have never heard shortwave radio, you, you won't really appreciate this the way you should. So he said to this king, he said, Oh, King, it's nice to have you in our country. Uh, how long are you going to be here? The king said, two weeks. <laughs> Tom Brokaw says, oh, king, it's nice to have you in our country. Uh, where are you going in our country, if you don't mind telling us? He said, ding, 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 ding. United Nations. <laughs> Barbara Walters says, Oh, King, my, you speak very good English. Where did you ever learn such good English? He said, Ing, ding, 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 ah, 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 
<laughs> now we can get to work. <laughs> I started to teach here yesterday on the greatest subject next to the atonement, I believe, that can grace the mind of man. Would you bow your head with me and pray? And I'd like to ask Heidi, would you lead us in prayer, and then I will pray. Would you do that for me, please? She's a good friend of mine and a good student. Please. Dear Lord, you said in your blessed book, you made known your ways unto Moses, your acts unto the children of Israel. The world wants to see miracles, but dear Lord, what we want, we want you to make your ways known unto us like you did to Moses. We know you resist the proud, but you give grace to the lowly. And dear God, you won't have them ever any lowlier than we are. So would you please bless us and have your blessed Holy Spirit come to the side of each and every one here tonight. Help us to shut out all truant thoughts and to think on these words of this blessed book that holy men of old gave their lives for that we might know thee. Oh, thank you, Lord. How we thank you for the good word of God. So Spirit of God, help us, we pray. We know if anything is accomplished and left through eternity, you'll have to do it. So. Help us to help you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So we started on this subject, the moral government of God, and I read to the folks, and I'm going to do it to you again tonight. From Isaiah 9, the sixth and seventh verses. I'm doing this primarily to show you this has a Bible basis, this great subject, the moral government of God. And by the way, in the New Testament, they have a phrase for it. It's called the kingdom of God. Now, a kingdom is a form of government, just like democracy is a form of government. Democracy is not a very good one. Republic is a lot better, and our country is supposed to be a republic, not a democracy, because democracy is nothing but mob rule. We wouldn't have had one-tenth of lynchings in our country. If it wasn't for that kind of mob rule stuff, which is a terrible blight upon on our country. Now, Isaiah 9, 6, 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I'd like to pause here. See that phrase, Everlasting Father? See the word Father there? That should not be capitalized because this is talking about Jesus, and Jesus isn't the Father. He is the Son. Now, if you know the English language the way you should know it, if you were writing Thomas A. Edison, comma, the father of the light bulb, comma, died today at age 92, you know it, you wouldn't capitalize the word father. This is Jesus as a father creation. You should know that because some Jesus only people get a hold of you. And they say, see, he's the same as a father. No, they're two different persons. And that word right there shouldn't be a, not be a capital F. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice, and from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, if that isn't more government, then words don't mean anything. Now, would you please turn to Matthew's the second chapter? And Jesus has just been born in Bethlehem. In fact, it is in the book of Nahum, it said he'd be born in Bethlehem. And I have told my Jewish or Yiddish friends, I mean, you know, when they have a baby boy born, they still gather around to see if they got the Messiah or the Messiah. I'll say to them in Chicago, what are you looking at a baby boy for? The Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And he was. 
<laughs> and it's right in your Torah here. It's right in it. And I take it, I show him, I t show him how he was prophesied he's going to live and how he's going to die, and he did. You know what I've had him do to me? And jump up, run right out of the hotel, say, Con, you're not going to convert me. <laughs> well, I can't. The Holy Spirit doesn't. But the Holy Spirit was talking to him through the Word of God, wasn't he? So a self-deceiver is a self-destroyer. Well, Jesus had just been born, and it's prophesied in the Old Testament that he had come forth from Bethlehem of Judah. Listen to this now. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, demanded them where Christ should be born. They said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, art not thou. The... For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. That shall rule my people Israel. Well, the phrase, the kingdom of God, is used 100 times in the New Testament, which is simply a simple way of saying the moral government of God. Because it's not a government of physical things. The 92 or more natural chemical elements, 100, maybe another 40 <laughs> synthetic ones. No, it's a moral government. Now, moral means having to do with right and wrong. Now, in our colleges, universities, out in Madison, Wisconsin, where I live 65 miles from it, I have it in my book that 400 college presidents met for about a week, and they came up with one monstrous conclusion. And that conclusion was, there's nothing absolutely right and nothing is absolutely wrong, and they were absolutely sure. <laughs> you get that? <laughs> So I concluded they, that they had been educated away from their intelligence. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are doing that today? Amen. Getting educated away from their intelligence. Now the purpose of higher education is to sharpen and refine and develop our common sense. So we can go on and deal with the problems of this world to feed the people in the world and to lead them from ignorance unto the blessed gospel. But education has gone screwy, so that nowadays black is white and white is black. And they're not at all interested in doing in education what they did in my day. Well, you're going to see something here. You won't necessarily see it tonight, but he says, shall rule my people Israel. Now, one thing you're going to see in the next day or so that the best minds in the world have tried to figure out is how do you govern someone and govern them absolutely without touching them or using force? I'll tell you, Jesus figured out a way to do it. Amen. Now, blessed word of God's got the answers in it. Now, that's one of the greatest questions that's ever dawned on the mind of man. How do you govern someone in the realm of right and wrong without force or without touching it. And the blessed word of God's got the answer. And if you keep coming back, you're going to get the answer. And if you don't get the answer, you're going to have confusion all through your life. Now we started here into my slides on the moral government of God. But this is where we finished last night, but that doesn't mean much to most of you people. So we're going to back up a little, if you don't mind. 
And I'll get to the part, Mame, that you want about a quarter after 12. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to have the friends read these for me. I will ask Dave Callahan uh, to start. And uh, once in a while, I'll have it varied, but I will give no comment. I just want you people to see these so you'll know when we get to where we should be. All right, we're going to start right there. Now, in this piece of paper, I show four distinct realms over which God governs. Uh, over here on the right is the inanimate creation, how God governs the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the natural elements that there are, and even your body obeys the principles by which he governs them. And all our engineering is to study the various laws of cause and effect, and we can formulate physical laws, and then as we produce a causation, we get the effect. That's really about all medicine and engineering, physics and science consist of. All right, now, where's, where's Dave Callan? Yeah. Oh, now David, would you read that one for us? And then I, as I go, keep on reading. Loud enough they can hear you back there, like as loud as you are on payday to get that check. <laughs> Beliefs are the opinions a man lives by, as distinct from those he merely entertains. In the sense, they constitute his philosophy. Beliefs. Beliefs. Beliefs are the opinions, convictions, values, and principles a man lives by, as distinct from those he merely entertains or prefers. I'd say 90% of the people go to church on Sunday morning. They prefer these, but they don't live by them. So if you don't live by them, you really don't believe them. Because belief is not only some sort of a phenomenon of the intellect, but no, it's believing something that you know to be true from God, and when you reach out and you obey it, then it's belief and it's faith. But not, there's always a verb together with the word belief, as it is in Hebrews 11 with faith. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea. God had told Moses and them, I want you to cross that Red Sea. That's enlightenment, is it? Well, just standing there doesn't get you across. So when you get out that water and get your feet wet, then God parts the Red Sea. Then it's faith as they start going. Up to that time, it's only mental ascent. And mental ascent won't get any man in the heaven. You can believe that Jesus died for your sins, but if you don't live in accord with him, in accordance with him, and if you haven't trusted him and come to know him as your personal savior, you're in bad shape. All right, now, proceed, please. Qualifications of the governor. Competence plus disposition equals right. It gives God the right to govern us, and we all need a moral governor, don't we? We all need it when you get honest. And man never gets anywhere until he gets honest with God and himself. Why govern? So that we will fulfill our planned relationships, such as a right relationship with God and with our fellow man. Why govern? So we shall live the way we were created or designed to live. God never designed man to live in sin. Sin is unnatural. Mm -hmm. Don't ever forget that. Sin is unnatural. Now, you may do it so many times, it becomes natural, but the consequences are terrible. <laughs> they're terrible. There's primary consequences and there's secondary consequences to everything that we do. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also but reap. Yes. Such government cannot be arbitrary but must be based upon the need for such control or regulation. Do you agree with that? The great God that made the heavens and the earth has never done anything arbitrarily. That means without a sufficient intelligent reason. 
I'm lecturing down at Mississippi State University. And I had lectured in Jackson a couple years before. And this is an on-college seminar, and they brought us fellows in from all over the country. And there was a German scientist there. His name is Heinz something. Chico Gruber, I don't know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and he says, Con, I know how you're going to start out tomorrow. You're going to talk about Jesus. You got it right, friends. <laughs> I acknowledge him in all my ways. Therefore, he directs my past. He says, well, if there is such a God, if there is a God, why did he allow that terrible, terrible thing to happen in my country? Do you know what he's referring to? The Holocaust. I said, let me ask you a question. Heinz, were you there? He said, yes. I said, why'd you allow it? What'd you do about it? He didn't do nothing. Oh, that's funny. We want God to do things we wouldn't even lift our finger for. I said, Heinz, I can, I can explain that to you. It'll make sense. And when I did, he finally finished. It took me 10 minutes because I don't have any easy answers. You know what he says? Wow! I never saw that before. I said to him, I said, you're a scientist. I'm a scientist. Do you ever do anything in your work intentionally, arbitrarily? Scientists and engineers, if you accuse them of being arbitrary, they'll fight you. If you're smaller than they are. <laughs> <laughs> you can kick their wife, that won't bother them. <laughs> but you accuse them of being arbitrary, no, those are fighting words. And I said to him, Heinz, do you do things arbitrarily in your work? He said, oh, of course not. Well, if there is a God then, now I've got to get you to agree on this or I can't answer your question. If there is a God that made the heavens and the earth and created our body, I don't believe in evolution and never did believe it. And I had 3,000 engineers and scientists work for me and not a one of them ever believed that. So don't you believe that all scientists believe in evolution? So a lot of them need it because of the life they live. Mm. It's uh, what I call it's the opiate of the pseudo-intellectuals. The opiate. So I said, would you agree with me on one thing? If I can't you agree with, get you agree with me on this, I can't go ahead. What is it? I said, will you agree with me if there is a great God that's created the heavens and the earth and this marvelous body that God has given to you and me that most of us can't understand one Tenth of one percent what goes on the inside of it. I don't care whether you're Mayo or who you are. Would you agree that he doesn't do anything arbitrarily? Now, somebody tell me what I mean that he doesn't do anything arbitrarily. What do I mean by that? Don't all answer once now. <laughs> Say it again, ma'am. Without sufficient intelligent reason. That's right, for what he does. And in engineering, you better do it too. Because I would walk among the drawing boards and sit down on them and I'd say, they'd say to me, Mr. Khan, you believe it'll work? I said, well, you ought to learn the English language a little better. To believe means to live in accordance with, and how can I live in accordance with a drawing? <laughs> <laughs> you should ask me if I affirm or I agree that it'll work. So I give him a little grammar lesson. <laughs> and and you gotta do that down in Texas. <laughs> well I taught I taught at Texas Christian and at Southern Methodist and Texas A and M and that one for about ten years. I think I know something about Texas. In fact, one time in a restaurant, this fellow's got his girlfriend there. Now in Texas, you don't curse and swear in front of a man and his girlfriend. You're gonna have to take him on. This guy, these two guys are cursing, swearing. This guy gets up. Mister, watch your grammar. He said, in my grammar, it's my grandpa we're worrying about. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them will get that on the way home. <laughs> Some come by slow freight, you know. <laughs> when he agreed with me that God would not do anything arbitrarily, 
I'll tell you from there on, it was a very simple job to explain why God would allow that thing over there to happen. And he wanted to know why he had never been taught that. He probably hadn't been in church in 15 years, you know. So you're not going to learn these things out in the world. To govern means to regulate, to control, to provide guidance. To govern is to direct and control the actions or conduct of substances or creatures so that they will fulfill their planned relationships. Dave, tell me the difference between substances or creatures. Substances would be those uh, things that are uh, made up of the, chem the chemical and physical elements, while creatures are those which are animate or have the ability to, uh, to, to live. See, when you read Finnish theology, if you don't know that kind of difference, it's going to be very, very tough reading for you. And in 100 years ago, in science, we didn't use a phrase cause and effect. They said of necessity, of necessity. I was the editor of his systematic theology. I knew that, and I'd had a course in what's called 19th century philosophy. And you know even what it was? It was physics. 19th century. So when I translate, or I uh, edited his systematic theology, I put a glossary in the back about that thick, so you wouldn't have to be run into a dictionary all the time. So that when he says of necessity of today, we'd say of cause and effect. Otherwise, words are tools to convey ideas. Now, if you're going to use a screwdriver like a scoop shovel, you're not going to load much coal or anything else. So we no, must not misuse the words, and we must know what these words are trying to convey to us. They are tools. So to govern is to direct and control. Now, when we get into the government of free moral action, there cannot be any, what? Cannot be any cause and effect. God doesn't overpower man's free will in the realm of moral things. By government, we mean that arrangement which administers supervision or exercises authority in regulating the actions of some thing or being, either by established laws or pronouncements. Some thing or being. There's two categories there, aren't they? Design purpose. Now, design purpose is a moral government of God. The production of the highest well-being of all, the prevention of the highest misery of all. That's why when you get to blessed gospel, you go to a foreign country and you start churches and get people in love with God, get active in the local church. Pretty soon you get a day school, teach them how to read and write, don't you? Then as time goes on, you get a high school. Then you get a, you get a hospital. And then you also get infirmaries. You get old folks, old folks' homes because the design purpose of the moral government of God in the world is a prevention of the highest misery of all. Now, if you go to the foreign field and you, <laughs> you plan a bookstore instead of preaching the gospel, you won't get those things. Just like if you want an orange tree, don't plant an orange. Otherwise, we'll go and plant the fruits of something. That's not the way it's done. You go out and take the blessed gospel that changes people's lives and hearts from living for themselves, start living for the glory, the excellency of God, and to love one another as they love themselves. And most men have got a very, very violent love affair going with themselves. And Jesus wants to save us from that. That bad love affair is going to wind up where it gets real hot. <laughs> Inanimate creation. This is the first one, friends. The first realm over which you're going to see how God governs. God in omnipotence holds absolute sway over the vast realm of material creation by producing an adequate cause for every desired effect. God creates by his great omnipotence and exercises perfect control according to his ever wise benevolence. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God besides me. Now, Fred, somebody tell me. Tell me what omnipotence means. We've got to get this word right. 
because about half of Protestantism has it wrong. I can't hear that. Don't speak below a whisper. Why? <laughs> Those are not right. Unlimited physical power. That's right. Say right. that again, Bill. Unlimited physical power holds absolute power over material creation. That's right. Unlimited physical power. It, now, it is a moral power here. We're going to get that when we get to the government of free moral actions. Because this isn't free. This is all... Because how does God govern? It's underlined right there. How does he govern the sun, the moon, the stars? Yes, even your physical body. It's underlined in red. How? How does he do it? Cause and effect. I can tell you, every person in this room, you bring them up here and you blindfold them. And uh, somebody, some of you backsliders, give me your cigarette lighter. <laughs> And I say, now blindfold him and have him hold his hand out like this. And let me get it going up here. Then I bring it around like this. Do you think he says, no, I perceive a rise in temperature? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You learn the word almost involuntary. <laughs> That's the cause, the heat. That's the effect. You get it? There's been no choice of the will there. So, in cause and effect, we're going to see how we differentiate that. Go ahead, David. Tell us. You have there a light switch and a light, and it's got a, uh, a closed circuit. And if you push that switch down, it becomes an open circuit. And uh, when you open that circuit, the light will go out. Electrons only go through closed circuits, right? Go ahead. And then if you uh, were to uh, re-push the switch up, you would close the circuit and the electrons would move through the, through the wire again and you would uh, get a light again. Fine. Now, what responsibility does a light have? None. None. Why? Somebody tell me. It's being caused. It's being caused. Could say forced. Being forced. Even a five-year-old boy knows that a girl being raped isn't guilty for anything, right? She's been forced. She's been forced. That's cause and effect, isn't it? How, how about explain this one to us, David? You did very well. I'm going to give you a good report card. <laughs> uh, you have a, a beaker or a flask there that's got water in it, and underneath it you have a Bunsen burner. And... Uh, Otherwise, we do it so much that we're not very careful, and there's one variable in there that gets away from us. So, but in God's cause and effect, are there probabilities? No. It's going to happen. He can handle all the variables. That's the difference between exact science and theology. But we know when it is. It's in the realm of cause and effect. It is in the realm of free moral agency and government. All right, David? Okay. <laughs> you have uh, a faucet, and if you turn the knob on the faucet, you have a flow of water coming through the uh, spigot, and it will uh, roll out onto the floor or whatever. And if you turn it the other way, and you, you close it, then you'll stop the flow of water. Yeah. When you release, when you turn it that way, you release the pressure, haven't you? Right, right. Now, ladies, and that water run all over the floor. Don't go down there in your high heels and start stomping in it. <laughs> Because it's not the water's fault. You'll ruin your high heels anyway. Maybe put holes in the floor. Otherwise, there's no choice involved in this. Now, there's a song that's out. Oh, have we got some bad theology in our song. Oh, they're terrible. Cause me to love. Cause me. Can you cause a person to love? <laughs> It wouldn't be love. <laughs> Cause me to love. I'm driving home from O'Hare. My wife and daughter met me, and then my wife buys tapes. You know, <laughs> bless her heart. <laughs> <laughs> Sentimentalism. 
<laughs> That's on. I said, Faithy, because I don't know anything in theology. I haven't taught my daughters. Boy, they know theology. I said, what's wrong with that record? She said, Daddy, you can't cause a moral, a moral thing. You can influence, but you can't cause it. I thought, well, I didn't fail raising her. But she know. But many of you know who Len Ravenhill is. When we get together, we start talking about Christian songs and some of the terrible words. Listen to this one. Let's see you men try this one. Lord, I'm prone to wonder, prone to leave the God I love. Try telling that to your wife. <laughs> Boy, isn't that uplifting? He's prone to wonder. He better get the altar, hadn't he? <laughs> He's a go-outer. Causation. That which is caused cannot be free. That which is caused cannot be, re be accountable, that which is caused cannot be responsible. Uh, and you and I, brother, could one, add one more thing there. That which is free cannot be predicted with certainty, or it's not free. But that's enough for moral government. Let me tell you something, friends. If everybody in the United States, especially the lawyers, knew this, it would be a different country. I was telling him last night, we have a Supreme Court justice. He played too much football in these younger days with his helmet off. <laughs> <laughs> he was a, became a Rhodes Scholar. Now, if you want to ruin an American, you just make a Rhodes Scholar out of him. He'll come home, 24 karat socialist. And socialism doesn't work. Did you know that? Mm. By the way, you want me to show you the purest form of socialism the world has ever known? That's when the government owns everything and they control everything. You own nothing. Well, one of the things in human nature is you don't take care of things you don't own. If you don't believe it, go rent a car and look at those rent -a cars. So, when you look into some of these things, it really don't make much sense. And I think God's people ought to be the best thinkers they are because they got the Holy Spirit within them to teach them and to enlighten them and to be a presence in their life that we can bow our head and reading anything and say, Dear Holy Spirit of God, would you please help me? Would you, Lord Jesus, you help me. Lord Jesus, you created the world. You're the great engineer. All things were made by thee, and without thee was not anything made. And I've prayed a hundred times, Lord, here comes Jesus, here comes that wooden-headed engineer again. Would you help me? And I tell you, he does it. He does it. I told you people here Sunday about this man calling from Pratt & Whitney Aircraft. They'd had people over from England to work on his problem. They'd had him from this country. So he calls the president of this big engineering firm, of which I was chief engineer, I'd gone to work, Brother Cook, that day I'd given all my money to missionaries. I had a quarter, <laughs> a week before payday. I could get to work, and I walked right through that cafeteria like a pay car passing a bum. <laughs> I get up there to my office. I go to work. I'm not feeling sorry for myself. I'm thanking the Lord that he's given me a chance to deny myself for the blessed gospel. Nine o'clock, up comes the president of the company, because I used to pray when I was in a mess like that. I'd say, dear Lord, I've given you everything I got. I'll see how you're going to take care of me today. <laughs> see, go out on the limb for the gospel, for Jesus. A lot of people don't believe in miracles because they never saw one and never lived the kind of life they where they needed one. You get that? Where they needed it. And here came the president of the company up. He said to me, as I told you, Sunday morning, Harry, the president, Pratt and Whitney called me up. And they got real trouble. And he told me who did I have in this. Now he's asked me, will I send you up there? I said, let me think it over. That's long enough. Because <laughs> I got $300 expense money, and I went right to the cafeteria. <laughs> and I had breakfast. <laughs> so I want to tell you, 
<laughs> well, it's wonderful to live like that for the Lord. It, it is. And I never fret it, never for a moment, because my God is real. How about yours? Amen. And Jesus is so near and dear and precious. I've been driving my car many times, having a worship service, my hat sitting over there. I'm talking to Jesus. He's so real, I moved my hat so he won't set on it. <laughs> He's real. He's real. Well, I get to Pratt and Whitney. Man, they looked at me like Thomas A. Edison's coming. I said, hey, wait a minute, these guys don't know. I graduated in the upper 95% of my class. I didn't say upper five. <laughs> I was one of those guys who made the upper half the class possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I said, I don't have all the answers, but I know the answer, man. Amen. Amen. And so I walk in these places. Never did I ever go in these big companies where they invite me to come. I don't stand and look away. This guy, talk to the Holy Spirit, help me to be a blessing to these people in here, the Lord. And may they see your great power work through my hands in this half horsepower brain. <laughs> half horsepower brain. We walked out in this big shop, and man, I got an entourage here that thought they was a king of Fredonia. <laughs> They're up with Slobovia. <laughs> we got out there, and there's all this big weapon. <laughs> I stand there, observe it. See, I started in a machine shop. I piloted a broom. <laughs> <laughs> then the scoop shovel. It weighed more than I did when it was full. Oh, I thank God for parents who raised me and taught me how to work. And work is right and holy and reasonable. And it's not a result of the curse of the fall. It's not a curse. No, work is to be a blessing. A blessing, and it is. That's why I'm 78 years old and I'm still working. I work five days a week. And I told you the other day, some people say, when are you going to quit working? I said, well, when my wife quits going to shopping centers <laughs> 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 and my preacher and my missionary friends don't need to eat anymore, then I'll quit working. I think it'll be right up to the time it takes me home. That will be fine with me, because I live on challenges. I keep my brain alive like that. You know, I know a lot of people that their brain's on a leave of absence. <laughs> I said, I don't want to go to the, to the YMCA and play shuffleboard <laughs> or checkers. <laughs> I can't help anybody like that. Can you? No, Jesus saved us to help one another Amen. and to bring honor and glory to our Heavenly Father. Not to play. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well do that to me if I got to do that. Take me home right now. This is good science here. I've done this in the, some of the finest universities in this country. And I say, you physics and you chemistry professors and you guys in the dynamic sciences, come on, argue with me. Don't do it after I'm gone in front of the students. You challenge me now in front of them, or keep your trap shut. Because I call a spade a spade. I don't call it a horticulture instrument. <laughs> <laughs> so, results by cause and effect in the physical realm. And physical realm is done by phenomenology. All right, here are five things. And this, by the way, this is the very boundary of science. And I'm here to tell you, the blessed study of theology takes off where, where science stops. You get that? It takes off where science stops. And we don't need to take a back seat to physical science. Not one bit. Because when physical science can't see it, on an instrument or any other way, if they can't touch it, if they can't taste it, if they can't hear it, they can't smell it, then they're out of business. <laughs> they can only go that far. They can only go that far. Now I can show you hundreds of problems where those are found behind the door. They don't help. 
such as a great phrase like the incipiency of the will. The incipiency of the will. Having been made in the image of God, when man has this mysterious ability to originate his own actions apart from any outside or inside influence. Because I taught him here last night and yesterday. Crime makes slums. Slums don't make crime. You think about that long enough. I tell you, the biggest cause of crimes are in slums. You know what it is? Adultery and fornication. That's the biggest cause. But the sociologists, they laugh at us. My daughter says in a lecture in college, she's studying sociology. And I never told my kids what to study in college. I know the average person changes their career six times for 26 anyway. But I did tell them what college they couldn't go to. Because that college, all it turns out is 98% snobs. And I said, now you can be a snob for nothing. I ain't going to pay $40,000 for you to be a snob. <laughs> Well, thank God they weren't that kind anyway. So my daughter is sitting in a class in psychology, and this guy's given that old turkey of a lecture, been around since 1890. You can put a man in a test tube and predict what he'll do, as if he has no free will. No, 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 you can't. So my daughter stood up, bless her heart, and her name is Faith. Bless the Lord, she's like a mother, not like me. She's very sweet and gentle and tender, but don't that, let that disarm you. That doesn't mean she's behind the door. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, said, any of you got a comment to make on my lecture today? My daughter raised her right hand. She said, my daddy teaches theology and he teaches science. I was with him, and he's teaching in Switzerland. And he says, that man is a product, now get this, he's a product of his heredity, his mom and daddy, and his environment, right? What else? And his training? Well, they leave it there. And the behaviorists say he has no choice in his destiny. By the way, John, John Calvin said the same thing. And so does communism, because we, the state, will determine your destiny. No, you won't. So my daughter said, Pastor, man's not just a product. His heredity, his training, and she says, you've left out the most important factor, according to Dr. Frankel, Victor Frankel and my dad. He said, what's that? She said, choice. The freedom of the will to choose between right and wrong. To choose whether he's going to study psychology, or is he going to study engineering, or is he going to be a horse doctor? Man has that ability to choice. Now, the greatest guy in behaviorism in our time is B.F. Skinner. And he says, you didn't choose to come here tonight, Brother Cook. You were conditioned to do this. Well, were you conditioned on Sunday morning to get up early and get out of the bed when you, you, you could have rested and you worked like a dog the day before? I worked very hard and wake up tired. Nothing caused condition me. I say, no, Lord, this is the day you made. This is your day. I'm not going to do my pleasure on your holy day. And I'm going to hear my preacher preach this morning. And I'm going to pray for him. And I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. I remember when I didn't, but I've done it so many, many times to hear the good word of God and be with my friends. I love to do it now. Otherwise, my head is for something other now than days than to keep my spinal cord from unraveling. <laughs> <laughs> to get it in the right place, on the right things, the right things. I never been, I never been caused to go to church. Oh, yes, my mama, when I was real young, used to take me to church. <laughs> Thank goodness I had a mother who knew more than I did. Most kids don't have that today. So I was caused in those early years, but later I had to make up my ch the choice for myself. 
when I finally got some sense in between here and there. You know, I had quite a draft board in World War II. They had two doctors. I wanted to look in this ear, and you wanted to look in this ear. If they didn't see each other, you were in. <laughs> So, this is the boundary of science, right there. But bless God, the word of God takes off where science runs out of gas. And you'll learn a lot about that in that paper of mine, the incipiency of the will versus determinism. You have it, don't you, Ron? Now, I, that's not original. Me, I had original idea once 15 years ago, and it died of loneliness. <laughs> You don't have to be original. Read what the smart guys have written, right? Not the funny paper either. <laughs> ah, now would you agree with me in the physical realm that God governs it, man does too by cause and effect. All medicine is that. All engineering is that. All physics is that. Cause and effect. And those elements, they do what we tell them to do. I mean, if we got it figured out right. All right, now he governs the sun, the moon, the stars, those 92 or more natural chemical elements and the 30 or more synthetic elements simply by cause and effect. You produce the cause, you get the effect. He made the world, he put it on a 23 degree tilt and he started spinning 364 and a quarter times. And every four years, he puts those quarters together, and the girls start chasing us. Because <laughs> that's leapier, you know. Most of us never had a girl chase us, you know, which is uh, their, to their good. <laughs> now, this is the second realm over which God governs. This is right here. This is this one right here. Ah, oh, you want to learn this one. I led Amanda Christ, a scientist designed a space shuttle. And he got on fire for God. And I tell you, he began to study and live a holy life. I could bring him here tonight, and he could teach you for five straight hours on how you can see God in the animal kingdom. How you can see God in the animal kingdom. He would tell you, I got him started on it. And I would have a blackboard in those days, and I would take a wavy line, and that's the Pacific Coast out in California. Then I'd draw the Columbia River or some river out there going north, wavy. Then I'd write over here, put on there a tributary, and over here a tributary, 50 miles on up the river. Then the little creeks, rivers coming off this. Then I'd draw a pond up here. I say, now here it is, 325 miles from Pacific Ocean, the salmon lays their eggs, and they're spawned, and they're, they get a minnow. And when that minnow gets big enough, they put a tag on it, tag. I put it on there, and when they've got that done, they will pull the board out. They call it a board of sluice gate. And it lets that water out at that pond, and those little minnows will swim down there, in the little creek, in the larger creek, in the larger creek, in the small river, in the bigger river. Pretty soon they're out there in the Pacific Ocean, and they have been caught 4,000 miles from where that river goes in the Pacific Ocean. 4,000 miles, because when you catch one, in there it tells you where to write to them and tell them you caught this. They've been caught down there at Terra del Fugo, if you know where that is. That's the bottom end down there in South America. Four years later, when that fish now is ready to spawn, where do you think it goes? Do you think it goes up to the Hudson on the East Coast? No. It goes right back up along the coast, up there to Oregon or Washington, or the state of which the river came into the Pacific Ocean. It'll go up there, then it'll go to that river, that tributary, then that smaller creek, and this one right there, and go on up, and go in that pond where it was spawned, lay its eggs, and die. And our great God designed that into fish eggs. Oh, that's some God, isn't it? Amen. 
And you know what they have done? Now, mind you, this, this creek here, this, I mean, this tributary, this river here, now we got one out on going the other way, uh, 50 miles on up the river, goes that way, and then we got all these little rivers and a pond up there. So we've caught those fish, struggling to get up here, put them in a tank wagon, give them a 300 mile ride, because we got the water in there to sustain their life and some food, 300 mile tank wagon, take them up here and up here, and within two or three miles of this pond up there, where they, the rest of them are struggling to get up there. We have put them in there. You know what they do? They turn around, go downstream, down there, and then they go up that river over here. Wow. Can't you say, praise the Lord to that. Amen. If you can't, you're dead. <laughs> Hallelujah for such a great God. Now in engineering, every time we design something, they want us to design it small. It's always small. I used to go to the town where I now live in, and I was the head of engineering research in this big engineering firm. I'd show them something new we had. Nobody would, oh, that's wonderful, con man, we've been needing that a hundred years. But, I said, don't but me, I already designed the one that's smaller. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> Miniaturization, we call it. Our great God did that in a fish egg. <laughs> now, if you've got all your ball bearings, you won't worship the fish. <laughs> you wish it the designer of that fish, won't you? You get what I'm saying? If you got all your ball bearings, you're not gonna wish it the sun either. All you get is a rough your mouth sunburn. <laughs> so how does God govern the animal kingdom? How? Instinct. Instinct. By the way, babies, the first three or four years of their life, about 90% of it, they're governed by instinct. So when these two kids in the crib, 18, 20 months old, and their cousins, one takes a, one takes a toy away from the other and bangs him on the head, don't they? Now, see that little sinful nation? <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. They don't know right from the Empire State Building, a wrong from Philadelphia. Billy's got to. William Penn stuck up there on top of it. But yet, listen, look at that little simple mention. Come on. Come on. No, no. That's instinct. Because they've been born, how are they going to stay alive? Well, the way they stay alive when they're born is God's been pretty good at this. He puts a little thing in it and goes, wah. <laughs> 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 Instant. He's hungry. You get him, you stick a bottle in his face, pretty soon he's full. And he goes to sleep. And pretty soon he's dirty. <laughs> a wet. And the acid begins to eat on his little bottom. <laughs> Here he goes again. Mwah. <laughs> 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 Now, if you're going to call that sinful nature, you need to go back to the first grade. <laughs> That's instinct. That's instinct. And the intuition. Now, we're born with the intuitive knowledge of right and wrong, but that doesn't come at that time. It comes several years later. But by this time, though, they've developed a little tendency to live for their sensibilities, aren't they? For what they can see, taste, touch. Begin to develop that tendency. And the brain isn't developed yet because these physical things have developed far beyond their knowledge. This is why Paul said, I was alive once. This is Romans 7, 9. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandments came in, his understanding of right and wrong, he says, I sinned, I died. I sinned, I died. Wages of sin is what? It's death. When we know right from wrong, when we choose wrong to gratify ourselves, that's sin. You always make a choice in sin. Choice. Not sometimes, every time. So this is how he governs the animal king. There's no right or wrong here either, is there? Now, David, would you please? Here's, here's the third one now. Ah, oh, friends, you've got to learn how God governs this. Because if you don't, you're going to have a ton of bad theology. 
You've got to know how God governs in this realm of providential government. All right, David, would you please read that? Governmental providence. The abnormal or unusual operation of God's wisdom in inciting men's wills to actions in various particulars through external events or internal persuasion, temporarily setting aside man's normal moral freedom and accountability under a law of cause and effect by coercing or constraining man's will. First thing, that word up to providence means his governmental provision. His governmental provision. This one. So we want to know how God governs in this where the will isn't free. Because one time he said to Moses, Moses, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let thee go. And Peter said, if he said why, he got the answer next. That my mighty wonders might be performed. And he gave Moses a staff. So they go calling on the Pharaoh. Now, I want to tell you, our great God's got a wonderful sense of humor. So they go down to the River Nile. By the way, one time I was speaking in the Cairo, telling my jokes, and I had them rolling in the Nile. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say I, but I said the Nile. <laughs> See, we can still laugh. We don't be, need to be so straight-faced, do we? <laughs> so they get out the Nile, and here's Pharaoh taking a bath in the Nile. This guy's been shaking his fist at God all these years. And God's people are treating him terrible. And he said to Moses, I'm going to harden his heart so he'll not let thee go. So what does God do? Here's a guy taking a bath in the river now. I'll show you, God's got a wonderful sense of humor. He turned it to blood. <laughs> How would you like to take a bath in blood? Well, he did. By the way, if you go look at the Ganges, same thing. Same thing. They worshiped the river Ganges. At that time, the river Nile was one of their gods. Now, every one of those 12 plagues that God and Moses rained upon Egypt and the Pharaoh, where they were destroying the confidence in the false god. Every one of them. See, now the Jews are beginning to learn something about our great God. They're learning now he's a god of power. He's a god of power. He makes his son to refuse to give his life. And the whole country, except in the land of Goshen, he burned a hole through. That's where the Israelites were. God takes care of his kids. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that. Every one of those was God destroying a confidence in a false God. You ought to study your Bible right close. You see that. Besides, what had the Pharaohs done to the baby boys, to the Jews? Put them to death. Well, they follow them down to the Red Sea, and it parts, and they're going across, and here comes Pharaoh, and they come galloping out there, and God flushed the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> the old boy, he got what was coming to him for killing all those baby boys. He reaped what he sowed, didn't he? Now, when they got on the other side, and God gave them the plans for the tabernacle in the wilderness, that thing right over there, the wall. Now, what they learned from that, first they learned up there, he was a god of power. Then, when they saw those people drown, they said, he's a god of judgment. He's a god of love, but don't make him lopsided. My mother loved me, but she spanked me. As I said, you've got to learn. You've got to learn that justice is an attribute of love. She spanked me because she loved the other kids. Because she loved me, but I wish she didn't love me so much. <laughs> <laughs> See, justice, get this, it'll help you so much the rest of your life. Justice is an attribute of love. Love is not a silly sentimentalist. My mother spanked me. That was love. That was love. Most people, oh, that'd be, well, they put you in jail for that now, wouldn't they? Especially up in New York State. 
I know a woman up there, a fine Christian woman, one of her little Indians was <laughs> beating up on one of her father kids in the front row. Yeah. I taught this woman in Switzerland, a brilliant woman. Her husband's a brilliant engineer with General Electric. She spanked that kid out in the front yard, and they came and arrested her and put her in jail. She was raised on the mission field in Cameroon for spanking her own child. I got a, I got a uh, announcement of their daughter getting married just before I came here, but she'd been put in jail for spanking. See, that shows you New York State has been educated away from their intelligence. Away from their intelligence. Now, read the next one, David, please. Such as, such as when he hardened Pharaoh's heart. When God causes a man to act, man gets no reward nor condemnation, because his will is not free. Now, give me another reason. I want you people to think. Why should Pharaoh get no condemnation when God's causing this to happen, why should he get no condemnation? Not just because he will isn't free, but there has to be another reason, a deeper reason. I want you to think about this. He's an agent of the Lord. He's Beg pardon? He's an agent of the Lord. Yes, he is an agent of the Lord. That's true. But why doesn't he get any condemnation here? And that's a good reason, sir. He's not responsible for his actions. He was not responsible he, for the that's right. He was not responsible for his action. But go ahead. No guilt. No guilt. That's right. Come on, some more. But you're not more getting down the depths of it. <laughs> that's good. What you said too, Mister. That's wonderful. What you said too, Bill. And what you said is right. It's not deep enough. Now, I'm not saying they're wrong. They're good. But you destroy his government if he did that. Okay, there you go. Yeah, there's the one. There it is. Okay, we got it. You explain that to me later. <laughs> it's true, his will isn't free, he's caused to do it. Those are just the things on the surface. Here's really the reason. What he has done or is doing, it doesn't stem from any right or wrong attitude or disposition of heart. You see what I mean? That's Christianity's religion of the heart and the intention of the heart. What's the difference between a woman killed a man with her car by accident or if she intended to do it? What's the difference? Murder. One is murder. The other is manslaughter. And one was evil intention of the heart. So in law, they can't get out the attention they, at the intention. They try, but man is too good an actor most of the time. My God, the great judge of all the earth, he knows the intention of the heart. The intention of the heart. As I said last night, there's a lot of unfinished justice in this world, isn't there? Where they beat murdered raps and they beat this and that. They used to teach in jurisprudence, with all the unfinished justice in the world, if there is no hell, there is no justice. But the Bible tells us 23 bucks of it. Yes, sir. The battery's there. Oh, I knew there's something wrong with me. <laughs> Bad time. Put it back in there. I can't do it. My eyes go this way, not that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm homely enough. I don't know. How did you clip that? In? I didn't. <laughs> Gotta pull that thing I out. don't think you got a college degree, have you? Uh, <laughs> 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 Better take it down the street to a machine shop and get it fixed. Hang on a second, we'll do it. <coughs> there you go. Ah, oh, boy, you saved my life.
Pick up your foot. Now you're all set. There you go. Where was I? Give my Dale Carnegie lecture on how to skin friends and the influential people? Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> my dear friends, not knowing the difference between this and the next we're going to talk about is what makes a Calvinist. Because they see, they say, look at Pharaoh. God hardened his heart, made him do all these things. God can save anybody, anywhere, anytime he chooses. What's wrong with that, David? Can't do that in salvation. He won't do it. He won't do it because that makes him a respecter of persons. If he ever causes one man to be saved, he's got to cause everybody in the world to be saved. Or he's a respecter of person. And he is not. He says seven times in the New Testament alone, I'm no respecter of person. So thank God he doesn't predestine you to go to heaven, your kids to go to hell. And you look in the Old Testament and election is very plain in the New Testament. Election is for special services. It isn't for salvation. Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. This isn't salvation, but ordained you to go forth and bear fruit. See, the election there is for service, for your place in the kingdom of God. That's why Paul would say, Brethren, I beseech you therefore to make your calling and the election sure. If it's all up to God, what are you doing making it sure? <laughs> make your election. That means where he's got you in the kingdom and where he's, like for instance, for Brother Gill, I'm sure he's made his calling sure that God put him here and God put him in charge. He didn't seek it, but he earned it. He earned it by a godly life and studying, and knowing what he's doing. But our great God does nothing arbitrarily. So you see, yes, there's predestination, but it isn't who, it's how. By repentance from sin, pay to our Lord Jesus, and seek him with all your heart. Then, after that, you're predestined to be conformed to the moral image of the Lord Jesus. That's the one we better be worried about. Be, you're predestined to be conformed to the moral image of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was telling them yesterday, in my class at some time in universities, I have 400. And by the way, I'm sure Mrs. Callahan could tell you, at MIT, the great school, they don't have eight, three and eight in class either. I taught classes at MIT. I had 166 in there. Who said? Like my little daughter. She went to school, six years old. She come home after six weeks. She wanted to go to bed all afternoon. Now that she didn't want to go to bed any time. She'd lay in there for a couple of hours and sing and do this and that. She'd all wound up. But here she come home from school after six weeks. Said, Mommy, if you'll let me stay home, I'll go to bed this afternoon. I won't get up at once and I won't make any noise. She said, well, Nancy, you better go back. I'll talk to your daddy tonight. So when I got home, she told me that. And I went in the living room. I said, come here, Dolly. I always called her Dolly Dumpleby. <laughs> Dolly, come here. Six years old. And I put her on my knee, hugged her and kissed her and told her I thank God for every day that he'd given her to Francis and me to raise for him. I said, Nancy, why don't you want to go to school? She says, the teacher balls me out because I can't read. Six weeks in school. Hey, man, I got men working for me. <laughs> <laughs> We're college graduates. I never call them to read out loud. Man, they're stumbling stuff all over the place. And last year, we had over a million high school students. In fact, it is in California, it's against the law to give a guy a diploma if he can't read or write. Imagine that. So I called up the principal of that school, and I said, Mr. Condi, this is Harry Kahn. I'd like to come see you tomorrow. He said, what about it? Well, I said, you know me. I used to have your job in Chicago. I think I know somebody about education. You can't tell, but listen to me, but I have. I can. And I said, 
Mrs. Olson is bawling my little six-year-old daughter out because she can't read. She's only been there six months. I said, I want her in your office at 9 o'clock in the morning. If you think I am kidding, you just miss it. Because I know how to get rid of tenure. It's about malfeasance in office. I can take you through the steps, brother. So I come in at 9 o'clock, and boy, they're both sitting there looking like they just swallowed a pork chop. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in. I say, Mr. Conde, shake hands with him, Mrs. Olson. I think the happiest time in youngster's whole life is in elementary school. was with me. But now my daughter doesn't want to come here. Only six weeks she's been in school because Mrs. Olson balls her out because she can't read. She said, Mr. Khan, I can't teach 24 children how to read. I said, that's funny. I had a teacher named Sadie Kiever. She taught 34 of us how to read. I admit you can't teach them how to read. You walking up and down the hall, drinking coffee all the time and showing three movies a day and taking them on silly field trips in the first grade. When are you going to start earning your money as a teacher? I'll tell you, tomorrow. <laughs> and if you don't, I'll bring a lawsuit of malfeasance in office against you, Mr. Condi, and against his teacher. I'll fix your wagon. Good. You don't play at the mind of my little daughter like that. I'm her daddy, and it's my job to look after my little daughter, isn't it? Let me tell you, dear friends, something. By Thanksgiving, she could read like an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> that rascal got to work. Boy, they want more money all the time. They already make about $300 an hour. <laughs> no more than they work. <laughs> See, the good word of God teach you how to think, won't he? Balling a little girl out. Six weeks in school, can't read. One thing you learn in teaching, like I do, and I teach executives, you don't ask them to read out loud. <laughs> you don't. So I told you this morning, in the American school system, up to fifth grade, we teach them how to read. After fifth grade, they read to learn. The average American has a reading level of a fifth grader, and that is 275 to 300 words a minute. I learned that Professor Yale, he gave us a test, and I read 285. <laughs> he said, you fellows were taught how to read. When you're fi in the fifth, up to the fifth grade, you haven't had a reading lesson since. And he said, here's the way you read. Now, like this. It's a book with 10 letters on a page, 10 words on a page. We one fixation per word, right? <laughs> then he taught us how to read two words at a glance. That took about three weeks. Then three words at a glance. I went to school with guys that learned to read 3,400 words a minute and knew what they're reading. Taught us comprehension. Listen, you've got a right to expect teachers to teach. To teach. That little girl, I'll tell you. She's a very, very successful woman that runs one of the best. She's got the biggest backlog of anybody in her business. And does she make money? That's all she makes. But do you know what she does? She and her husband support missionaries all around this world. My wife is walking down Michigan Avenue with her in Chicago. A great big fat bag lady come up. Hi, Nancy. Nancy, could I have a half a dollar? Go get a hamburger. I don't know where you get a hamburger for half a dollar, but Nancy took out her pocketbook and she gave her a dollar. I walked down the street. My wife said, Nancy, that big woman like that, she had anything to eat. Look at and you give her a dollar? She said, Mama, I also gave her a track. I gave her a track. How am I gonna give her a track? I'm gonna be cheap and chintzy with and the Bible says, Give to every man that asketh of thee. That's the way she's raised. <laughs> I told him, there's two traits you never find missing in Christians. They're givers and they're forgivers. You find either one of them missing, 
they better get the altar, right? Because Christianity is a life of giving and forgiving. That's what it is. So if you're married to money, you better get repent, get married to Christ, that you might be. <laughs> yeah, it says that in the Bible. Do you know that? That you might be married to another, that you might bring forth fruit unto God. Strongest analogy in the Bible for being converted. And someday Jesus is coming back for his bride. And his bride is made up of those people that love him and obey him and have the wedding garment. Revelation 19, 7. Spirit the bride say come. For his bride hath made herself ready. She's got the wedding garment and it's made out of pure linen. Now it goes on to tell you what this metaphor really is. Pure linen says in the next phrase which is the righteous acts of the saints. <laughs> Not Jesus' righteous acts. Your righteous acts. Your righteous acts. You remember a man that came to a wedding supper in the 22nd chapter of Matthew and the parable of the great supper? He showed up with no wedding garment. What did they do with him? Cast him into outer darkness with his weeping and white, gnashing and... You know what? Christ is coming back for his bride. His bride is made up of those people that have the wedding garment of pure linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. Huh, he wants us all to have that wedding garment, doesn't he? Now, go ahead, David. Governmental <laughs> providence is not referring to salvation. It is when God intervenes in the acts of man to bring about his purposes or plans. Yes, you know, Proverbs 21, 1, it says, it says that, that God takes the heart of a king, and he turns it whether, so ever he willeth like a river. He can take a mayor, he can take a governor, he can take any public official, and he can turn him like, like a river. You know how rivers go. And he can cause them to be doing things they're not even aware that he's causing them to do. And I'm going to show you one here in the Bible. But, dear friends, this thing of providential government makes up at least one-eighth of your Bible. You've got to be able to recognize it. That's why most people, they get bogged down in the book of Revelation. They don't realize that 60% of the book of Revelation is providential government. It's God moving. It is a man. It's God coming out of his holy place. God, governmental providence is not referring to salvation. It is when God intervenes the acts of man to bring about his purposes or plans. Man gets no reward nor any condemnation when he says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turneth it whithersoever he willeth like a river. He can make a king or a president walk on his ears because he designed the ears. <laughs> He can make him do it. He won't even be aware that God's making him do it. There's, if you go back and you read the 12th chapter of John, here they're trying to, they got Jesus on trial, you know, up in front of who? High priest. High priest, that's right. These guys have been reading Shakespeare, not the Bible. <laughs> and it says, it's a custom. And once a year, like that, we give a man the freedom not to be crucified, not to be this. They didn't give it to Jesus. The Bible says, this he spoke not of himself. Where do you think he got it? This he spake not of himself. Dear friends, I don't want to preach when I'm not speaking of myself, do you? I want to be smart enough that I got enough sense to say what I ought to say and know the word of God the right way. Now, Mr. Ron Cook, would you please read that one for us? Here's a good example of what we're talking about, a providential government. Go ahead, brother. Also in writing, 
It was a proclamation of emancipation. Now you see, 70 years before this time, God had Jeremiah prophesy that the Jews are going to leave captivity and go back to Paris, or I mean back to Jerusalem. You know why he could prophesy that did not happen? Because he, God, is going to cause it to happen. There's no free will in this. Like it says here, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah but be fulfilled. What? That in 70 years, by the way, every seven years, they were to give the land its rest, weren't they? What do we call that kind of a year? What? Jubilee. Sabbatical. Sabbatical. Give that land a rest. Well, the Jews got so hungry and so greedy for 10 of those jubilee years, they, they didn't do it. And they were so stupid because if you read your Bible closely, on the last year of those seven years, the last year, God would give them a crop twice as big. Twice as big. But it's like they asked Mr. Rockefeller one time, how much money is enough, John Dean? He said, just a little bit more. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's never enough when your heart is selfish, is it? Amen. Never enough. Amen. So, they missed 10 sabbaticals. How long were they in captivity? 70 years. They give that land a rest. They paid for it. They paid for it. They sure did. I'll tell you, Christian men, if you don't have to work on Sunday, don't do it. Because you pay for it. You pay for it. How? Hospital bills, all kinds of ways. When I ran a corporation, I got the, all the servicemen to get the engineers together. I said, I'm answerable to God. Now I run this company. And it's true, we want to make a profit. I want you to know that there's not a man to get on a bus or an airplane on a Sunday. That's the Lord's day. That's not our day. And you don't go catching a bus into O'Hare because you want to get back early Friday morning. No, no, no. That's the way the heathen do it. You catch, you leave on Monday morning at a decent time, and you if you get your work done on Wednesday, you come back on Wednesday. But you don't travel on the Lord's Day on W.A. Whitney Corporation money. If you do, you got to answer to me. Because we're going to please God whether you want to or not. <laughs> See, one thing about Whitney, the inmates did not run the asylum. <laughs> you see, you see providential government here? Now, somebody show me where it is in there, the providential government. It's right there on the line all by itself. When he starts moving, God's moving there. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Yeah, you got it right there. God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. I don't think Cyrus even knew it. <laughs> he said, well, I'm going to write a proclamation. This isn't right. For we got these people over there. I'll bet you a month later, he said to his wife, honey, we got the dirtiest bathroom here I ever saw in my life. She said, yeah, you're the one who put all that free help and sent them home. You go clean the bathroom. <laughs> I bet he said, yeah, why did I do a dumb trick like that? Well, God put that in his head, and he was about as free as if I dropped this, whether that's free to drop or not. Because God stirred up the spirit, put it in his head and his heart, what he's going to do. Because it's right, it's reasonable. And about one-twelfth of your... Uh, about 12% of the Bible, 12 and a half percent, is providential government where God moves in. But don't make that and mix it up with salvation. You see, when that's the thing I'm trying to get across to you, dear people. Calvinism don't recognize this concept of the providential government of God. But it's in the Bible in so many, many places. But now it's been called to your attention and that's the way God governs. So, there's three realms we've covered here tonight. I admit very quickly. But there's one word, these first three. I want to give you the word. 
That is characteristic of me. You ought to write it down. The word is certainty. Certainty. God always gets what he wants in this realm, these three realms. Why? Somebody say it loud enough you can hear it three feet away, will you? <laughs> yes, yeah, somebody else. How about you, Pat? Cause and effect. Every one of those. God always gets what he wants. Now, tomorrow, we're going to start, how does God govern in the realm of free moral agency? And you'll find that God very seldom gets what he wants. And that's enough to make you cry for God. Because you know what I read in my Bible about God? God said about the Israelites, he says, Israel, I'm broken with your horse heart. I'm broken with I've raised children to do this, and I got this. In many places, he is broken with the disobedience of the Israel. He could have destroyed them a hundred times and been just. But he's long-suffering, he's gentle, and he's tender. And people take advantage of that, don't they? You know the main reason I want to obey God? I hope you all get this. In Zephaniah 3.17, God says to you people that are living a godly life and a holy life, and the people all over the world, he's saying, I'm going to sing over you, I'm going to joy over you, I'm going to delight over you, and I want to live a godly life because God's happiness is more important than mine. When I disobey him, I don't get happy anyway. You know that you people in this room have this great ability due to the Holy Spirit of God living within you. You have the ability to live a life that can bring joy to the heart of God, and he can sing over you. Yes, oh, can't you get happy about that? I used to do everything I could for my daddy in his last years to make him happy. And my mama, I took care of him. And my wife and I, we did without. We lived in a two-room apartment. Our furniture was early ugly. <laughs> <laughs> she used to call it early Salvation Army. And I had the biggest engineering job in the city of Chicago, but that dear daddy of mine, my mother, I'll tell you, I'd have shoveled manure up to here so that they wouldn't be in need because they had brought me into this world and dad worked like a dog. And I'll tell you, when I'm 16 years old, I'm playing on American Legion baseball team. I later could make my living at it. I never was bad enough to be with the Phillies, but I was a pretty good ball player. <laughs> <laughs> the Phillies had some guys playing shortstop for 600 a month and carried their own lunch. <laughs> <coughs> now I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> 16-year-old baseball player. Early Salvation Army. That's right. Do you think any man that God is saved, and his spirit dwells within him, can see his mom and daddy be in need? It's patient when my dad's 80 years old, 83, 84, 85. I moved from New York to Chicago to be near them. I wanted to comfort them. So when I was 16 years old, my daddy... He got me into the living room of our house. Now, I told you, we had a big house. We had 11 kids. My dad and mother shooed all the kids out of the house and put, took me in the living room. My dad sat down. He says, son, I notice you're playing on this American Legion team you have for a couple of years, and they're a pretty rough, uncouth bunch. And we noticed most of them smoke. And I don't doubt you tried it. I didn't know he said exactly. Because I had. But I was like a guy when he got saved. He said, I had to quit smoking. Was I glad? It always made me sick. <laughs> 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 he said, now, son, your mother has worked very hard to raise you and your sisters and your brothers and to clothe you. And we're not done yet. we got a couple years yet to go. I want to try to help you. I'll teach you enough you can go through college. I can't, I can't give you the money. I'll make it so you can make a lot of money. I used to make $120 a week as a tool and die maker and going through college and carrying 16 hours. Now, that's not easy. It's not easy. And nobody gave me anything. 
but I had a daddy that trained me up here and put some skill into my hand. So, he said, she's worked hard. We got much work to do. He said, son, we're not going to tell you you can't smoke, but we will say this. If you appreciate what we've done and we're going to do, we'd appreciate it if you didn't smoke. Could I smoke when a man puts it to me like that? Has worked so hard to raise 11 kids. Wouldn't I have been an ungrateful wretch? I'll tell you, from that day to this day, I didn't do things to ever displease my daddy. Because my daddy was a smart man and I had a very, very godly mother. Then I learned, honor your father and your mother. What a wonderful thing for God to tell me. Amen. Honor my father and my mother, and for this is right. It's also intelligent. <laughs> and, so, and things shall go well with thee. And so shall your days be long upon the earth. What a wonderful thing the Bible told me. To honor my father and mother. Now, I don't know whether I'm going to live another week, but it doesn't matter. 78 years ain't bad. It's eight more than three score and ten, isn't it? It isn't a matter how long we live. It's how we live for God and what we are living, isn't it? Amen. I know he's not causing me to do this. So, here's just one of the hundreds of examples in the Word of God of God moving into history. As I said to some of you, when he appeared to Moses in a burning bush, take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. Well, who, what God is this? Now, our names always meant something, didn't it? Khan means study. I never lived up to it too well. Silversmith, you knew what, that's the guy's name. You knew what he did, did for a living. Blacksmith, you knew that, right? Well, how are you going to give a name like that for our great God? And Jehovah is not his name because Jehovah means a self-existent one. That's a description. So he never really answered Moses. He just said this, and this is greater than heaven his name. I am the God that acts. I am the God that acts. He'll intervene in history. Oh, you people have read, and I see in Phil's library, and he's got the light and the glory. Isn't that a great book? Man, a hundred Indians trying to kill George Washington. God had great things in store for George Washington. They couldn't kill him. And how they got out of Brooklyn over to the United States, they ought to try it yet in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and the things that God did for us to win our freedom, our independence from Great Britain, all they want to do is milk us. They never helped us. But thank God how he's looked after us. And I'm going to tell you what I do. Every time I hear the Star Spangled Banner, I'm old-fashioned. I put my hand right there. And you know what I do? Then I thank God for watching over my brothers in the service. Every time I hear it, because one was a, the chief on the USS Orion, and the other one was a Swabby <laughs> down in New, New Mia, New Caledonia, way down in the Southwest Pacific. And he's the guy that drove Nimitz, not Nimitz. Bull Halsey. He was responsible for his life. Boy, they knew who to give it to. My brother Bowen is tougher than a quarter state. <laughs> 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 and he watched over Bull Halsey like an old hen out of their chicks. And then people got too close. You get back, mister, unless you want to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> you get back. That guy's close. And he'd take him out in the in a flag all boat, any of you Swabies in here know what kind of a boat that is. Take him to the boat, pick him up at midnight, bring him back in the land. And he had an important job to watch over one of our top men. But every time I hear that Star Spangled Banner, I stand there, I don't care what it is. I thank God for protecting millions of American boys that came home and for watching over my two brothers. See, the bigger the family, the more you're interested in one another. Amen. I prayed every day for those fellows. If I didn't hear from them, I had a real good way. I'd say to my oldest brother, 
I'm so sick and tired of this. What I'm doing, I'm going to join the Navy. Bang, I'd get a letter right back. Don't you dare, Harry. You're doing more good now what you're doing. You, with your background, they'll probably make you in charge of the head. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you don't know what the head is, don't ask me. Because <laughs> I worked with an engineer in charge of salvage, making all the parts good after they've been scrapped by those butchers out in the shop. And he joins the Navy. You know what they did with him at Graduate University of Illinois? They put him in charge of salvage on a ship. And his job was to take those cables and screws that those swabbies would get around the screw down there and twist it off. And he's a deep sea diver. That's not what a salvage engineer does at all. The boy, they fire a letter back to me. I'd hear from him by return mail. Don't you dare. This thing's about over. You're doing more good where you're at. Which means they cared for me too. Hundreds and places in the Bible when you see that. It's God intervening, a God that acts. I told him here, Ron, <laughs> yesterday about a friend of mine. His daddy was a Wesleyan preacher. Graduate University of Colorado. Got a master's degree in philosophy, then went to the University of Chicago, ran into some of my friends and got saved. Got saved. Scott Reed has written some ter terrific stuff, hasn't he? Well, he's calling house to house and room to room and apartment to apartment in these high-rise buildings. And this night about 10 or 11 o'clock and he's dead tired. He gets on the elevator in two big blocks. Just start taking his this, and they're taking his money and his purse and everything. Now they're taking his belt. His pants are beginning to go down. <laughs> he puts his hands up over his head. Oh, God, they've gone far enough. Show them who's God. And boy, there'd be a God come down in there. He's scared the living be jabbers out of them. They were laying on the floor by the time they got, until it got to the, <laughs> see, when you're living right with God, you see what I mean? Ah, oh, God will watch you over you, especially when you're doing his work. Show him who's boss, God. Oh, did he? <laughs> did he? And I've had some dear friends that has happened to him all around the world because they put him first, <coughs> give him supreme place in their life. Now, this is a government of free moral action, but it's now 933 somewhere. I'm just going to read this. This is where we're going tomorrow. Now we're going to see how you can touch something or how you can govern something that's free without touching it. Now, the best minds in the world have wanted to know how can we govern these people, really govern them right, that are free. And we can't do it with causation. And we're going to see that tomorrow. Brother David, you read that and we'll close, please. Free moral action. The normal course of accountable self-caused action, where man is allowed to choose between motives presented to the mind to form his own moral character and be sole author of his destiny. Here God says, I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Look at that phrase in yellow, self-caused action. That just drives us shrinks crazy. <laughs> Because you've been acting funny, lad, because you was too harshly potty trained. <laughs> <laughs> and they call that education. <laughs> you get enough of that, you're done. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So <laughs> oh, but you can see why they would but want to run me out of some of these colleges I teach at. <laughs> Brother, would you dismiss us? Amen. Amen, because what is free cannot be caused, or it's not free. Now we're talking about salvation tomorrow. You come tomorrow, and you're going to, you'll begin to learn. You won't get it all. 
how God can control something that's free without touching it, without forcing. Boy, I'll tell you, best minds in the world have struggled with that, but they left God and the Bible out of it, so therefore they never got the answers. Thank you. Thank you for being so kind to listen and to know a good joke when you hear one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for coming all the way from, let me see if I know the name of that town. Well, I'm having trouble. I have trouble with my memory. And the only reason I know one's name is I memorized it. <laughs> <laughs> What's the name of that town, Ron, you gentlemen are from? I'm from Greenwich. That's it. Yep. They're from Greenwich. They come all that way up here. See? They didn't have to get a passport either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. So good to have you gentlemen with us. I hope God's spirit blessed you tonight and taught you something. That's, he's in that business. Thank you very much. Uh, the meeting's dismissed, but if you... <laughs> it's all yours, Russ. That's it, we're done. Hey, how about liberate me here, brother? <laughs>